Welcome to Operating Systems Lecture 23. Right. So last time we were talking about locking, and uh, we took this example, this hypothetical example of uh, of a bank with many accounts, and uh, with functionality like transfer uh, and sum. And we said that look, uh, coarse grain locking can solve all the concurrency problems, but coarse grain locking is not good because uh, it serializes everything, right? So because it, it ensures that everything is mutually exclusive, it basically causes everything to get serialized. So even if there are multiple processors, only one transfer function will be able to execute any time if you are using coarse grain locking. So, so then we said, okay, you know, we should use fine grain locking. And the question was, how should you how should you decide how to use fine grain locking? So this choice of how to choose where to use fine grain locking is a bit of an art. So there's no, so I mean it's basically something that the programmer has to decide based on uh, based on what he feels is the right way of doing things. Right? So there is no one rule or uh, to say that this is how you should fine grain lock in, in this program or that program. Depending on the program, you would want to choose your fine grain locks differently. So for example, uh, you know, yesterday we said that uh, every account should have. Uh, uh, a lock, so there should be a per account lock, and any operation that require, require, requires access to multiple accounts, you should take all the locks before doing that uh, operation. So all the locks for uh, all the locks for all the accounts that are touched in that operation. So transfer operation touched two lock uh, two accounts, you are going to take two locks. Uh, the sum operation touched all accounts, you are going to take all locks, right? Uh, and uh, we also said that one, one way to take the locks is to take it in an on-demand way. When I say I, ta I, I take it in an on-demand way, it doesn't mean that I release the previous locks, right? Because this operation is basically an operation that needs to be atomic. We need to take all the locks at some point in time anyways. It's just that you can say that you know, I'll take the account, uh, lock for the first account, then do some computation, then I'll take the lock for the second account without releasing the account for, uh, lock for the first account, and so on, right? Uh, so you could do that, but uh, we also saw that the locks have to be in a certain order to avoid deadlocks, right? And so the ordering uh, the, and the ordering has to be global. Once again, uh, you know the programmer has to figure out what the order has to be, and uh, and the order will, may be tied to your data structure. It may be tied to the semantics of your program. For example, the last time we we decided that we are going to order it on the account ID of the account. And uh, based on that, we'll take a priori all the locks uh, needed. For transfer, we'll take two locks. For some, we'll take all the locks, do our atomic operation, and then release all the locks, right? So, um, so, so that, was the, uh, that was a hypothetical example, of course. Let's, uh, let's look at another example. Let's say I have a file system. So as, you know, as an operating system, one of the services that an operating system provides you is a file system. What is a file system? A file system is an on-disk data structure. Right? So a disk is nothing but a, a raw magnetic device which has lots of blocks. And a file system is a data structure built on top of this uh, sort of storage, uh, which allow, and, uh, and the semantics of the file system are usually a file system is hierarchical. So you have a root directory and then you have some names. And each name uh, may be a file or a, another directory and so on. And so you basically build a directory tree and that's basically what, uh, what a file system is. Now you can imagine that there are multiple processes running in the system. Multiple processes are making multiple system calls concurrently. So one is calling read, another calling write on different files, on same files. All these are possibilities. So question is, the the operating system needs to synchronize or make sure that operation accesses to the file system are correctly, uh, you know, are correctly done. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, you know, it basically means that uh, operations should be atomic. So if there's uh, there's an operation going on here and an operation going on there they shouldn't appear interleaved uh, at any point because interleaving of those operations can cause bad things in your file system. All right, so you know, one option is, once again, coarse grain locking. Put a lock on the entire file system, you're safe, definitely safe, right? But of course, that's not a very good solution. You can imagine that your system will run at very, very slow speed. You know, nobody will be able to access the uh, file system concurrently. Only one person will be able to access the file system at the end. So what do you do, once again, Choosing what locks to take is a bit of an art. You may say, let's have uh, a lock per directory. Or you may say, let's have a lock per file. Or, uh, or you may say, let's have a lock per, you know, just hy hy very hypothetically, let's have a lock per pair of files. You know, if you figure out that most of the operations are actually occurring on pair of files, so why not, you know, have a lock instantiation per pair of files? And if you're going to, uh, you know, do an operation between those, those two files, or something, but you know, when in that case, if you are going to touch one file, then you have to take all the locks in uh, which uh, 
for that file where that file belongs to a pair. So if, you know, for all the pairs for that file, you need to take a log. So that doesn't make a lot of sense. So yes, I mean, uh, you know, intuitively it seems like the best thing to do is basically take a file per log, a log per file. All right. So, so, so what I'm going to show you is basically, you know, if you do this kind of fine-grained locking, uh, it it hurts your program structure. So the program structure is not does not the modularity in your program actually reduces because of this uh, because of this locking behavior. So let's say uh, because of fine-grained locking, basically. So let's say I have a function which uh, which looks like this. It says move. Uh, so it's just moving a file from one directory to another directory. So it says move uh, this file name called old name from old directory and put it as new name in new directory. Right? So, it, so that's the semantics of this function. And what it does is it basically looks up, uh, looks up the disk block. So let's say i number is a disk block or, uh, or some identifier which is uh, identifying the number at which this uh, file is stored. It just looks up the, the old name in old directory. Delete, deletes old name from old directory and adds new name to new directory at that i number that you looked up, right? And so this code is correct. Let's say when, uh, when you're run, running serially, when there's only one thread that's accessing it, this code is also correct if you're having one big lo global lock that's protecting this entire function. But let's say I have per file locks, right? So or per directory locks. So let's say I have per directory locks, and uh, so what do I need to do? I, I'm accessing um, I'm accessing uh, the old directory. Uh, reading and writing the old directory here, so I need to have uh, I need to lock this region with the uh, with the old directory's lock, and I'm adding something to new directory, so I need to lock this region with the new directory's lock. But can I do these in isolation? Well, no, because uh, you know I want perhaps I want my move operation to be atomic, right? Uh, if I if I just say that oh let let you know let uh, di uh, directory delete, do the locking inside it. And I don't care about uh, you know what locking it does inside, and then let direct directory add do the locking inside it, and uh, I don't care. Then what happens is at this point here, no locks are held, and anybody is free to observe these directories or the state of these directories. And at this point, what you're going to find is that this file doesn't exist anywhere, right? And so this, the file system is in, in an inconsistent state at this point. Uh, you know, uh, so there there is some there are some disk blocks that don't uh, that are not pointed to by anybody, N neither by the old directory nor nor by the new directory, and that's an inconsistent state, right? In other words, you know, if you do do it in that way, the move operation is not atomic, right? So what you would what would you want? You would again want to do basically uh, something like this. You would say acquire old dir dot lock. And acquire new dir dot lock, right? And then you will do this operation, and then you will just release these locks. So what has happened is basically because of fine-grained locking, any function that is that is building upon these. Uh, so earlier, it was very modular. You know, a move function could have been written in three lines, and without having to worry about what these functions are doing inside, whether these functions have to take a log, not take a log. That's not my business. I just call these functions. But now, because I'm doing fine-grained locking, now it is my business to know what logs are they going to take, right? And in fact, instead of asking them to take them, I'll need to take them on their behalf, and I'll need to take them in a certain order, right? So in other words, basically, what I'm saying is logs. And modularity are sort of uh, you know uh, so locks basically hamper modularity, right? So locks are not uh, not very friendly to modularity. They sort of make your code more complex, less modular, right? Earlier you could just say that this function is going to do delete, this function is going to do add. I don't care what it does internally, but now you have to worry about oh this function is actually going to need to take a lock, and this function is going to need to take a lock. And, uh, and because I need to do this atomically, instead of them taking a lock, let me take a lock on behalf of them. And now because I'm taking a lock, they shouldn't be taking a lock, and so on. Right? So the, the entire semantics of your function has become complicated. The semantics are not just that this, func this function is going to delete a uh, name from the directory. The semantics now need to be this function is going to delete a name from the directory, and it should, not, it should assume that a lock has already been taken, and it should not be taking a lock itself. So, so I mean, uh, locking and fine-grained locking, especially, sort of complicates things. Um, all right. So, so let's um, let's look at locks uh, and locks implementations. Uh, 
in a little more depth. All right. So we uh, we said that uh, how are locks implemented? You know, one of the uh, one of the one of the ways we implemented locks uh, in a couple of lectures back was a spin lock, and where we said that uh, there's a function called acquire. Right, and uh, let's just take struct lock star l, let's say, and it just says while, um, and let's say this this is a function which is internally calling the exchange instruction. So I'm calling the exchange instruction, and uh, so you know one way to do this is let's say there's a register which I put a value one into, and then I say while exchange register address of the logged field in L is equal to 1, I keep spinning otherwise I return. Right? So you know just, uh, just read this code once more. Uh, basically what I am doing is uh, I am basically trying to put the value 1 into the logged field of this L. Right? So I am basically want, I want to put a, a value 1 into the logged field of the uh, L variable except that I want to make sure that earlier it was 0. Right. If it was earlier one, then I should be just waiting for it to become zero. Right. So that's basically acquire. That's the semantics of acquire. And here's how I'm implementing it. And we've seen it before. Uh, so I put the one value in R, and uh, this this function is going to atomically swap R and this memory location L dot locked. Right. And so uh, if L dot locked was zero, R is going to become zero, and so you're going to come out of the loop. But if L dot log was one, then R is going to remain one, and you're going to retry, uh, put making it, uh, you know, retry it till you see a zero value in locked, right? Right? And we also talked about uh, last time why this implementation is an atomic, or you know, it works because if two two threads try to call exchange simultaneously, one of them will occur before the other. They cannot get interleaved. So the swapping operation is atomic, basically, right? So everybody remembers this, right? Okay. All right, so let's see what happens at the hardware level when you execute something like this. All right, and just for completeness, let me just also write release. Release is just uh, L dot locked is equal to zero. Yeah, okay. Okay, all right, so let's see what's happening at the hardware level. So mm -hmm. let's say here's my bus, right? So we have seen this diagram before. I basically always draw a bus here. And I say that here's my CPU, right? And let's say this is CPU zero, and this is CPU one, right? And let's say this is memory. Okay. And inside the memory, there is this uh, variable called L dot lock. And in the CPU zero, there are private registers R's, right? And what, I'm, what each, th let's say both the threads are executing simultaneously on CPU zero and CPU one. This thread is going to set it to one. This thread is going to set it to one. Both are going to say exchange. One of them is going to win. Whoever wins gets the lock. The other one just spins. Right? That's what's, uh, that's the idea. Typically, you have, you must have studied in your uh, operating system class, or in your computer architecture class, that every CPU also has a cache. So let me just say cache. So my first question is when I call the exchange instruction, is it okay to just exchange from within the cache? So L dot logged is just another memory location, right? And so when you access it, it just comes into the cache. And uh, can the exchange instruction just you know, do the local operation without having to go to on the disk, on the bus? No, because you know, because L, because the exchange operation is an atomic operation, and they need, and there needs to be serialization between who is doing that. Uh, you know, so there has to be some communication on the bus. Either the communication has to be directly with the main memory, or they have to talk with each other to basically make sure that you know there is serialization. Either he wins or he wins, right? So one of them is going to get zero, and the other one is going to get the answer one. Both of them cannot get the answer zero basically. And so there has to be some bus protocol here that has to happen here. And so each exchange instruction will require some bus transaction. Right? In general, memory accesses don't necessarily require bus transaction. Right? Whenever I read or write a value, if the value is found in the cache, 
I can just uh, locally satisfy it from the cache. It's only when there's a cache miss do I need to go to the memory, right? And typically, you know, these, pro uh, these processors have what's called a cache coherence protocol. Uh, so the idea is that let's say I access the memory location A and it gets cached here and then this CPU accesses the memory location A then you know there is some protocol that's going on here which will invalidate this uh, location and then validate and then bring it here right so you know if these both these CPUs are accessing the same location then there will be some uh, bus transactions that are shuttling this uh, variable between these two right in any case you know when we are doing this exchange uh, business then uh, the problem is that there is there is a lot of bus traffic basically going on you know if there are two cpus there are a certain amount of bus traffic if there are uh, four cpus there are more, there's more if there are eight cpus there's even more if there are 64 then you know basically bus is definitely the bottleneck so cache coherence protocol is for every memory access all right so for every memory access clearly i mean you cannot have so the hardware ensures that you know there is some sort of, uh, so there's, that's what coherence means. So there's coherence in accesses. It cannot be that the same location has two, two values, basically, at the same time. So for every memory access, the cache coherence protocol works. It need not work. So if, if the same CPU accesses the same location 10 times, it's only the first time that there will be a bus transaction. The next nine times, it will get satisfied from the local cache without any bus transaction, without any cache coherence protocol getting having to kick in because assuming that this other CPU is not accessing that location, that location is locally satisfied from the cache, all right? But if you are uh, executing the exchange instruction each time, then you have to make a bus transaction because it has to be atomic with respect to everything else, right? So in, our, in, in the code here, let's say if there are, uh, you know, if there are, if there are four, two processors, one of the processors gets the lock, the other processor just keeps calling exchange and the exchange, all each exchange execution exchange is causing a bus transaction, and so there's a lot of bus traffic. Okay, so this is not not the best possible implementation of a spin lock, and uh, and how can you make it better? Well, one way to make it better is, for example, put another loop here, which is not using an atomic exchange uh, exchange operation, which is just checking. So exchange instruction is a more cost, is costly ex operation because you know, it needs atomicity. On the other hand, uh, this operation is just a read operation. A read operation is a less costly operation. It doesn't need atomicity, right? And so what I'm doing is I'm basically, you know, in, instead of every time calling the expensive operation, what I'm basically doing is I'm, I, want to, I'm wait, I want to wait for logged to become zero, right? And so, Instead of doing it, in, but I'm doing, I also need the exchange instruction because I want to sort of swap it atomically. So the checking code can be, uh, can be done through just reading. And then once, you, once the read says, yes, it has become zero, then you can retry the exchange operation. It's not necessary the exchange operation will f uh, succeed, but it's a high likelihood that it will succeed this time, right? If it doesn't succeed, no problem. You again come back here and you again wait for it to become zero, right? So what will happen in this case, let's say, uh, you know, both CPUs try to do exchange. One of them wins. The other one just calls the loop. And this time, that, uh, the inner loop is going to sa get satisfied from the cache. Right? So the inner loop is going to get satisfied from the cache. You have reduced the bus traffic. OK? All right. All right, so, so this is all good. But let's see what happens if you write code like this, you know, without having to, uh, you know, let's say you write this code in C. You just say uh, while exchange, and then in the inner loop is while locked. You know, a comp uh, if you, uh, you know a compiler is basically uh, looks at these variables and decides which of these variables to register allocate and which of these variables to uh, keep in memory. Right. So what happens if this variable becomes register allocated? Right? So uh, I hope uh, people understand what is register allocation of a variable. Studied in the programming languages class or Right? So basically the idea is, let's say, um, let's say there is a variable called A, and say A is equal to 1, you know, B is equal to A plus 2, and C is equal to two, 3 into A, or whatever. And so the question is, one way to deal with A is basically say that, keep it in memory, and each of these operations are memory accesses. And this other way is basically read A into 
a register. So let's say there's a load instruction, and you read A into a register, and then you op perform all these operations on uh, on R. So you say, you know, R plus two is equal to B, and C is equal to three into R, and let's say you also say A plus plus. So you say R plus plus, and then later on you can say store R to A. Right. So this is uh, this is a common optimization, a very a most basic optimization of a compiler. That if there is a memory, if there is a variable, instead of so variables are basically you know have a one-to-one -one relation with the memory location, but if there are multiple access to a variable and the program and the compiler can see that there are multiple access to a variable, the optimization is that you just bring the variable from memory into a register, do those accesses to the register instead of the memory. So you have saved some memory accesses, and then after you have computed the thing, you just save it back into the into the memory, right? Common, uh, common optimization of a compiler. Similarly, in this code, this variable l dot logged, a compiler is free to register allocate. So, what can happen if the variable gets register allocated? It's an infinite loop, right? It'll never finish. So, you know, with the best of the intentions, compilers are not really you know playing well with the, what the operating system re, uh, designer really wants. And so, uh, you know, either either the operating system designer writes this loop in assembly, or actually the compilers give you special keywords to basically say, "Oh, don't optimize this variable." All right. So there's a, quick, for example, on C, there is a variable called uh, there's a keyword called volatile. So if you declare a variable, with, you know, or a field with a volatile struct uh, or with a volatile type, then basically the compiler says, "Oh, this is something that you know the comp programmer has really written very carefully. I shouldn't be optimizing it at all." Right. So you know, just an interesting example of how uh, you know how a compiler writer. So a compiler writer does not worry about concurrency and does not need does not understand which one is what is a lock and what's not a lock, etc. He's just looking at code and he's just uh, you know optimizing it. But um, you know, if you are writing the special code like this, you should basically basically declare things as volatile. And this is one of the reasons why you know it's right, difficult to uh, difficult to uh, get concurrent programs correct. Notice that you know it's easy to basically say that acquire fun write this acquire function very carefully, and then use this acquire function to mark critical sections. But on the other hand, if I didn't want to use locks and I just wanted to very carefully write this sort of code, then I have to worry about oh the compiler shouldn't optimize it and uh, you know other things like that. And so that's a very hard thing to reason about in general. All right. Um, the other thing a compiler and even the hardware does is reordering, right? So if um, if I basically have uh, an instruction that says a is equal to one, and then I say b is equal to two, a compiler is free to reorder these instructions, right? For a compiler, these are completely different memory accesses, completely different variables. It doesn't matter which occurs first, right? On the other hand, if you look at our locking code, you know reordering is fatal for our for our logic. You know, because if we are writing to the locked field, and then we are accessing some shared variable, if the compiler reorders these things, then you know the critical section is outside the lock, or before the lock, and bad things can happen, right? So uh, similarly, it's possible that the release, the, so the sh the, uh, the an access in the critical section, is reordered after the release, right? So for example, um, in this um, in this case, l dot log is equal to zero. Before this, I had a shared variable access. You know, these two com are completely independent memory accesses, and uh, you know, a compiler may say, "Oh, let's just reorder these things." It's not just the compiler who can do this; it's actually even the hardware that can do this, right? So, uh, most so modern hardware basically do out-of-order memory accesses, right? Even the Intel ar architecture, and the most of the performance they get are basically because of out-of-order memory accesses. And the reason you need to do out-of-order memory accesses is because some memory accesses are going to take a long time, and others are going to take a short time because some memory accesses may be cache hits. And others maybe cache misses. So whatever is a cache hit, you know, let's just do that first. And what is the cache miss? You know, let let it come whenever it when it's ready, right? So even the hard, even if the compiler played well with you, the hardware can actually reorder accesses. So it's possible that the locked access lock variable was in cache and just sort of got you know get, got set first, and later on the other critical shared variables getting set. So once again, you have to be very careful in doing this. And uh, and so you know, modern processors provide. Um, what are called fences, right? 
So we basically put a fence, and the fence is basically saying that all memory accesses before the fence should have finished before any memory access of the after the fence starts. Okay. So, so the idea, you know, from a hardware designer standpoint, is that in general, let's allow reordering of memory accesses, re reordering of unrelated memory accesses, of course, which seem unrelated at least. But a programmer has a way of saying that okay, here's a memory access and here's a memory access. So in this case. If I want to disallow this, so let's say I want to say that this, is, this should not be possible, then I'll put a fence in the middle. So that's a, you know, so there are multiple ways of fitting a fence. It's very architecture specific. You, you know, you have special instructions which you can say that you know, here's a fence. There's a fence instruction, so you can put a fence instruction so that way this will will get disallowed. Or there are special instructions like the exchange instruction itself acts as a fence, right? So some instructions will never allow reord ordering of uh, across the, themselves all right okay good uh, all right so so let's look at this um, this uh, implementation again so what i'm saying is that the exchange instruction itself is acting as a fence in the case of acquire and in the case of release the programmer should put a fence in some way or the other right either a fence instruction or instead of using a simple write you use some exchange instruction to do the write for example all right. Okay. Now let's say uh, so. This is a spin lock, right? And uh, let's say I'm an operating system developer, and uh, uh, I basically also get interrupts. Right? So these spin locks will protect against uh, multiple uh, concurrent accesses by multiple CPUs. But if I am within, let's say I'm uh, I'm within an, within a critical section, and an interrupt comes, the interrupt handler will get to run. And if the interrupt handler also needs the same lock, then there are problems, right? You can either end up with a deadlock, or uh, yeah. So if 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 you're doing it like this, then if if I am within a critical section, and uh, and uh, I'm holding a lock, and it's possible that the interrupt handler also wants to get the same lock, then I'll have a deadlock, right? So and you know the 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 most co the core of the operating system typically has such code. For example, there's a lock. To protect the process table, p table, in x v6, for example, so that lock is you know is being accessed by multiple functions, and even the interrupt handler or the timer interrupt handler is going to need to access this p table lock, right? And is going to need to access the p table and is going to need to acquire the p table lock. So such locks uh, are you know are even more special, and so what you do is uh, in that case you basically make sure that not only do you uh, just do this, you also disable interrupts in your acquire and you re enable interrupts in release. Right? Uh, so, so you, you know, when you acquire a lock, any lock, if you know that this, uh, the, uh, these locks can be acquired by or can be requested by interrupt handlers, you also disable the interrupt. So, within the critical section, an interrupt is not possible anymore. Right? It's only when you really uh, you quit the critical section will an interrupt get get in the way, and uh, yeah. So you know on x v six you will find a function called instead of just cli and sty you will find push cli, and uh, instead of sty you will find pop cli. And the idea here is that it's possible that uh, you know you you are trying to acquire multiple locks. So let's say you acquire p table lock first, and then you acquire file system lock second. And uh, both of them wanted to, you know, both of them need to do cli, but then let's say you release one of those locks, then you don't want to immediately do sty. So basically, you have some kind of recursion. So each CPU, so there's a CPU pointer dot. So there's a there's a CPU dot n cli variable, and so push cli just does uh, CPU dot n cli plus plus, and if CPU dot n cli is equal to one, then you actually call cli, right? Which means you just transition from zero to one, so you actually need to disable interrupts. And similarly, pop cli, so that's push cli, roughly speaking, and that's prop cli. So pop, pop cli is basically uh, CPU pointer on n cli minus minus, and if CPU dot n cli is equal to zero, then sty. Right, right. So uh, clearly, I'm talking about within the operating system where the interrupt handler can require 
would need to acquire the same lock that you are holding, right? Only in that case do you need to disable the interrupts. And I, I'm really talking about the the real inner core of the kernel, okay? So for example, when you see implementation of the spin lock in the XP6 kernel, and that spin lock is basically used for your p table lock and uh, and other, among other things, you will basically find that the acquire function not just does the exchange to protect against other CPUs, it also does a cli to protect against interrupt handlers. Okay, so you need to do both these things. All right. So and also this nCli variable is a CPU private variable, right? So you uh, there are ways to say that this variable is only going to be accessed by this CPU, and so no other CPU can uh, will ever be able to access that variable. Or you can just have an array with you know per, uh, where each element is accessed by only the corresponding CPU and nobody else. So that's a per, per, per CPU variable. So let's say I'm in the user mode. Okay, so I've talked about kernel mode, but let's say I'm in the user mode, and I want to do uh, I want to implement my let's say banking application. And uh, and I want to implement locks. So, what kind of locks should I use? Well, uh, firstly, the question could be, uh, you know, whether I'm running on a multiprocessor or a uniprocessor. Uh, or, in fact, even before that, the question should be whether you want to implement a spin lock or a blocking lock, right? So, if you want to uh, do a spin lock, do you need any kernel involvement? Unless you want to disable interrupts, would a user uh, level lock need to disable interrupts? I said you need to disable interrupts only if that lock could be requested by an interrupt handler. I mean, assuming that the user level locks are just private to the user and the kernel has nothing to do with it, then the interrupt handler has nothing to do with that lock, right? So you will not need to disable any interrupts for a user level lock. Okay. So can you do implement a spin lock without having any kernel involvement? The answer is yes. Okay. All you need to do is declare a variable. And use the exchange instruction. Exchange instruction is an unprivileged instruction, right? It just has the semantics that things will be atomic. That's all, right? So the same code that I showed you, this one, without the without the cli, implements a spin lock in user mode. Okay. So a spin lock in user mode is as fast as a spin lock in kernel mode. You just basically, you know, try to atomically set it to one. And if not, you just spin, just in exactly in the same way, and hopefully your critical section was small, and you will immediately get the lock. All right. Um, does it matter whether you are using uh, kernel level threads or user level threads? Because user level threads will only run on a single CPU. You don't even need to do this exchange business, right? Uh, user level threads will only run on a single CPU, and so instead of using a spin lock, you would probably want to use a blocking lock instead. Right, and of course, so blocking locks will be used either if you are using user level threads, or if you are you're sure that you know your threads are not going are going to run on a single CPU for, for whatever other reason there could be, and uh, and if your critical sections are known to be very large. Right, for example, if you're making a system call while holding that lock, you might as well just you know uh, use a blocking lock rather than using a spin lock. Right, so in all these cases, you will not use a spin lock; you'll use a blocking lock. Do you need kernel involvement to do blocking locks? To implement blocking locks. Yes, because a blocking lock basically needs to tell the kernel to change my state from ready or running to blocked, right? And so I need, and the only the user has no way of changing it from ready to blocked, and so it has to tell the kernel to do it, right? So there has to be a kernel interaction, unless of course you were using user level threads, in which case the kernel has no idea, and so your in that case your user level scheduler is just going to is just uh, changing the state of your uh, you know currently running. Thread to uh, to uh, from ready to block. So in that case, your p table is maintained at the user level. So in either case, the p table, the state in the p table needs to be changed from ready to blocked. If you are running kernel level threads, you need kernel interaction to do that. If you are running user level threads, you can just do that locally in the user. All right. So let's see how blocking locks are implemented. Right, so you can imagine that there is a p table, right? Or you know, I'm using a, a an array, but you could even have a list of uh, PCBs or any such data structure that's maintaining all your process PCBs, process control blocks, right? And uh, what you're going to do is, let's say somebody says lock, and he's not able to get the lock, 
then uh, you will basically uh, want to change its state. So let's say this is a process and this is currently running. Then uh, and it calls acquire. You would want to change its state to blocked. Right? And you would want to record that uh, it is blocked on whatever was the argument of L. Uh, acquire so let's say blocked on L, right? And then if somebody calls some uh, some other process, so this becomes blocked. So this never gets to run in future, till somebody calls release. So let's say here's the process that was running, and then it calls release L. And what release is going to do is it's going to go over the p table, right? And uh, pick up one process that is blocked on L, right? So this from here, this here the L's are matched and change it from blocked to running or ready. Not running, but ready. Right? So it will change it from blocked to ready, right? So that's how blocking locks will be implemented, okay? All right, so but this P table structure itself it needs to be protected. You know, access to the p-table uh, structure itself by multiple threads needs to be protected. So you will use a spin lock to protect the p-table, and then and so blocking lock internally will use a spin lock to protect this structure and uh, to switch from running between running and blocked these different entries, right? So there will be a p-table dot lock, let's say, which will be a spin lock. Well, I mean, will the p-table dot lock only be needed for a multiprocessor? Well, you know, so on a uniprocessor, a p-table dot lock uh, equates to a CLI, you know, clear interrupts. So basically, you want that while you are in the middle of accessing the p-table, nobody else should basically interrupt you, right? So uh, on a multiprocessor, you will use a spin lock. On a uniprocessor, you could do that just by disabling interrupts. Basically, what you want is mutual exclusion while you are accessing the p table, right? And mutual exclusion on multiprocessor only way is spin locks. Mutual exclusion on a uniprocessor the way is disabling interrupts. Okay. Now let me talk about some locking variations. Yes. All right. So there is something called a recursive lock. So uh, you may have seen that sometimes we run into this situation where you acquire a lock and then you call some other function and that wants to acquire the same lock and at that point we deadlock, right? Because the same thread cannot acquire the same lock multiple times. So uh, you know the recursive lock basically what it does it it allows the same thread to acquire a lock multiple times. Right, and the semantics of a, of a recursive lock are fairly simple. Let's say this is recursive lock. Let's say this is recursive acquire. L, uh, you will say if L dot owner, you will keep something called an owner, is equal to current thread. Then L dot count plus plus all right else else you call the regular acquire all right and uh, you set l dot count to 0 and l dot owner to curl thread So basically the idea is you know a lock is supposed to provide mutual exclusion between multiple threads. If for some reason the programmer feels that you know or for modularity or whatever reason if he feels that the same thread wants to acquire the same lock multiple times let's allow that. Right? So that's the that's the that's the spirit behind the recursive lock. And of course recursive release will just basically decrement count and only if count becomes zero does it release the lock. Right? So that's what release does. So should I write release? So let's say, let, let me also write release. Uh, 
we will just say L dot count minus minus if L dot count is equal to 0 then release L dot lock right okay something like this right so this is a recursive lock sounds like a good idea or a bad idea no idea <laughs> okay so it's actually a bad it's generally considered a bad idea to do recursive locks all right and why basically usually the the semantics of a lock is that when you acquire a lock uh, you know at the point when you acquire the lock and you just enter the critical section you can pretty much assume that this that the state is in a, con is a there's a consistent state of the system right so the idea is that if you have been able to acquire the lock anybody else who has released the lock has left this con uh, has left left the state the shared state in a consistent consistent state right or has left the left the memory in a consistent state right that's basically that's basically how, that's basically been our invariant right that if I am able to acquire the lock, I can assume that at the first instruction of my uh, critical section, the system is in a consistent state. And the other invariant I usually maintain is that just before I release the lock, I have ensured that the system is again in consistent state, right? And so then I release the lock so that the other person who requires it will also see the system in a consistent state. So generally, you know, you, the assumption is that as you have acquired, if you have acquired the lock, the system is in a consistent state and you will maintain it in a consistent state before you release the lock or you'll keep it in a system consistent state. But if you do recursive acquire, then you know, then it's possible that you have a function foo that uh, you know says, let's say I'm going to say recursive acquire is r acquire l does something, makes it, makes it inconsistent, right? Makes the state inconsistent, hasn't released the log right yet. So he's going to say r release here, somewhere here, but he calls bar here right and bar internally is going to say r acquire and he's going to start doing something but he's going to assume you know assuming that these code has been written you know in mod or modular fashion in a different file or different program or whatever he's going to probably assume that it's in consistent state or assume consistency but because you know you're using recursive locks you will you know you will violate that assumption and and this bug will be much harder to find so in fact you know using recursive lock you have made it easy for your program to have bugs right that have not been that cannot be found on the other hand if you didn't use recursive lock you know the first call to bar would have told you oh there's a bug in your program right because it, there would have been a deadlock right there right so in general you know a programmer wants to keep his thinking simple and consistent with this idea that when you get a lock, things are consistent. When you release a lock, things are consistent. And uh, and if, if the programmer is indeed doing that, then recursive acquire is a bad idea. All right. Okay. Then there is another uh, another variation of locks called try locks. Okay. So what are try locks? Instead of uh, so the it's the same thing. Let's say um, instead the so. So, so the idea is that acquire um, L has a return value now int, right? Which basically says, and you know, the release is just void. And the acquire basically says success or failure. Right? So. In our, in our regular lock, an acquire basically always succeeds or it waits. In the case of a try lock, you try to get the lock. If you didn't get it, you just return a minus one or a, you know, a failure value. Right? And, when you f and so it's, it's up to the caller to do whatever he likes. Of course, you, know, you can implement a regular lock using a try lock, very easy. You can just sort of put the try lock in a loop and you get a, get a regular lock. It may not be the most efficient way to do a regular lock. right? But but the advantage of a try lock is it gives some flexibility to the caller. He may want to say, oh, let's try to acquire this lock. If I don't get it, oh, then I have something else to do. Let's do that first, right? And then retry it. So, so it gives him that flexibility. On the other hand, the previous lock and acquire basically is committing that I'm definitely going to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to either do that or wait, basically, right? So try lock gives you some flexibility into uh, you know, whether you want to uh, 
uh, whether, you, whether you want to wait or whether you want to uh, do something else. Let me now uh, discuss a real example. So, um, I hope you all know that the banking example that I took earlier was a very, very hypothetical example uh, for many reasons. Firstly, you know, bank accounts are not maintained in memory. Secondly, you usually don't write code in such a way where you're going to do a global sum operation on all the accounts. You would want to do some kind of more distributed and uh, segmented way of calculating sum, and so that there's more scalability in your system. Or you know, whether you want to calculate sum at all, you can just you know update the sum as the transfer is going on or something like that. In any case, it was just a, uh, an idea, a way of telling you you know what the problems of fine grained locking are. Let's take a more real real example of a web server. Right. So, what is a web server? A web server is, let's say, you know, this running on this machine, which has a disk and it has a network. And uh, and a client sends an HTTP request. And receives a reply. HTTP response. And tip, I mean, uh, let's uh, let's take a simple case where the HTTP request is a URL, and the reply are the contents of that URL, which is an HTML page, let's say. Right. So how is a web server like this implemented? Well, uh, uh, well, let's say. You know, at a very high level, the web server is probably running a loop like this: while one, so while true, no, it's an infinite loop. Read message from incoming network queue. Let's say URL is equal to parse message. Right. Uh, read uh, URLs file. So whatever is the URL, you know, you can parse it to get a file. So let's say read the URL file from disk. Right. And then write. So you get the URL file from disk. You get the contents of the file, and then you write those contents. So write uh, as a reply. So you write the reply to outgoing. Network queue. Okay. So what am I assuming here? I'm basically assuming that um, there is a network queue. Right. Uh, there's somebody who is filling up this network queue. So there are packets being received on the wire, and those pa those packets are getting stuffed into this network queue, incoming network queue. There is this server that's running that's picking up packets from this incoming network queue, processing them in this way. And then there is an outgoing network queue, which you just and the server is putting things to an outgoing network queue, and there's somebody who is picking things up from the outgoing network queue and putting them on wire. Right. So let's see what is the performance of this web server. All right. So basically, what will happen is let's say there are multiple clients in this. Uh, let's say there are you know there are multiple clients that are accessing this web server. Their uh, requests will get queued in the incoming queue, and uh, you know, depending on how many clients there are, what is the concurrency level of clients, the, the queue will keep filling up. And the server will uh, pick up one request and uh, start serving it. So, you know, the maximum number of clients that it can serve in a second is depends on how, how much time it takes to execute this code, right? And how much time does it take to execute this code? By far, the most expensive operation in this is this. Reading the URL from disk is by far the most expensive operation. These operations are likely to finish in, uh, you know, hundreds of nanoseconds to maybe microseconds or something. But this operation, a URL from disk, is an operation that takes milliseconds to complete. Right? Uh, why does a disk take so much time? Why the other things are so much so much faster? Uh, have we discussed this before? Uh, no. Okay. So. So let's say there is a, so typically today's modern CPU runs at one to you know let's say three gigahertz, right? 
or roughly 1 to 2 nanoseconds per instruction. Okay, so 1 to 2 nanoseconds per instruction. Uh, if the instruction was a memory access and the memory access was a cache hit, then also you know typical uh, execution times are 1 to 3 nanoseconds. So cache hit including cache hit. If it is a cache miss then you know let me put approximately and roughly 100 nanoseconds for a cache miss or let us say main memory access. These are all electronic op operations. These are just uh, you know semiconductors uh, exchanging el electrons to basically access uh, either cache or memory or things like that. The only reason memory is sort of more costly is because you have to travel a longer distance. You have to go over the bus. There's some bus contention that you have to worry about, and then you get to the memory, and then uh, you know. But it's all electrons traveling, and so it's very fast, right? On the other hand, uh, you know, a disk access or a magnetic disk, which uh, which has persistence, is a mechanical device, right? So a, uh, a disk, actually, um, if you look at a disk, then it's a mechanical device. Uh, so it's a mechanical device with moving parts. Okay. Um, exactly. What is the structure of a disk, uh, and why? Uh, and so you know, hence it's much more costly, and it's on the order of you know 5 or let us say you know 1 to 10 milliseconds right. So that is 10 to the power a million times slower than an instruction access right. So which means that accessing a disk operation in that time you could actually have executed a million instructions in, um, in CPU. So we are going to discuss uh, how a disk is organized exactly and what what determines whether what what the access time is exactly, and then uh, what does it mean for a web server and uh, its uh, its scalability, which means how many concurrent clients can it support, and how you can optimize it, uh, and what role does multi-threading have to play in optimizing it? All right, so we're going to look at that. Okay, thanks.